Welcome to today's webinar. We've now reached the top of the hour. So I'm uh, delighted to welcome you to the webinar, Customer Feedback Strategies That You Cannot Ignore. Uh, delighted to have uh, with me uh, today two uh, excellent speakers. Delighted to have uh, Jeanette Coulthard from Polestar Coaching with us. From those of you who've uh, read a lot of uh, articles on Call Center, you, helper, you'd have come across a number of uh, uh, Jeanette's uh, articles that uh, she wrote for us probably quite, quite a while ago now. And Jeanette, you've uh, recently started a, a coaching company called uh, Polestar Coaching. What sort of services do you offer? Well, I, I offer a range of services. So for businesses, um, I can coach around growth um, and really problem solving and, and, and fixing things. Um, for teams, I can work, I work with teams to, help make them work together um, better so that there's synergy um, and that they actually really unlock their potential to deliver on targets or the strategy. And then with individuals, I work, uh, I've got a special love for job search coaching and helping people find uh, new roles, particularly those who've been made redundant, which they find it extremely difficult sometimes to, to actually position themselves. Um, and then helping them personal development. So it's really rewarding. Excellent. And I'm also delighted to uh, welcome uh, Simon to the uh, webinar program. Simon's probably best uh, known as uh, running the top, uh, let me get the words right, top 50 contact centers <laughs> for customer service program. I think if I've got the, the words right for that one. Uh, you, you have, Johnson. Thank you. Thank you for the invitation. Indeed. Yes, many years ago now. Indeed, and uh, Simon is now uh, working with uh, working with Savio, and you're going to be talking on on customer feedback and also how technology has a role to play. I am yes, amongst uh, amongst many things. Um, so Savio is a, uh, a contact center and CX technology specialist, but uh, we're very much under the mantra that customer experience should be great all the time. So um, so I'm going to try and bring some of my uh, my experiences in the uh, in the customer feedback world to uh, to life a little bit later on. And if you want to meet uh, Simon in person, there is a, an event, a free to attend event in London uh, on the 17th of March, which is called. Uh, Savio's uh, Disrupt CX 2020, which uh, I understand has got some very good speakers, including the BBC, uh, Forrester, and the great and the good of the uh, contact centre industry, which would uh, which would be great. Um, if a little bit of housekeeping, if you want to watch a replay of today's webinar, uh, that will be available uh, later on this afternoon. Normally, about it takes about an hour for us to get uploaded after the webinar is finished. Uh, we're carrying on the chat room today. Uh, uh, alongside the alongside the webinar, uh, so it very much suggest if you can uh, dial into it. It's just simple. Go to a browser. The easiest way is just type cch.chat. It's a, a speed dial into your browser or into your mobile phone, and that will log you into the chat room, which I think uh, uh, could work out very nicely. And um, uh, there's an added advantage of being uh, in there that we do have a quiz. You can uh, do it through your mobile phone. Uh, it is in a separate window, so perhaps have the chat room on one side of the screen or the and the webinar slides on the other hand, or if your screen's quite small, uh, go into the chat room on your phone. We do have these uh, voting buttons now. We've got a quiz that we'll have after Jeanette's uh, presentation. So first of all, pay attention uh, while you're watching Jeanette's presentation if you want to get some of the answers, uh, uh, top marks in that. Um, and then we've got these voting buttons, A, B, C, or D. Added also advantage being in the chat room is you can ask questions and or leave a tip. Uh, we, are, we have got a prize here. It's a very nice bottle of champagne uh, for the winning tip, or if you prefer a box of chocolates or an Amazon gift card or even a charitable donation, we can arrange uh, uh, that as well for the winning tip. So I'm going to start off with a poll. This isn't in the chat room. This is on the on the screen. And that is just a simple question. Do you connect, collect enough customer feedback in the contact center? One of the questions I get asked is how do we get uh, uh, more people responding to our survey? So be interesting to say, do you feel you collect enough customer feedback in the contact center? So uh, I think we've got most people have uh, 
voted on that now. I'm just going to share the uh, results here. And um, quite interesting, 28% uh, say yes, and 50% say no. Simon, does that surprise you? No, not really. I, I don't think so. I mean, I, I still... I still come across lots of organizations that are struggling uh, because of data fundamentally you know how to how to get the right data to be able to then send surveys or or you know solicit some kind of feedback and that tends to be the the key problem um, I think that's probably what I was expecting they 're not sure is interesting um, I think a lot of people still struggle as I was mentioning before about what is a st statistically robust sample, um, how much should we be uh, should we be collecting so that we're confident that we're driving change from the right things. But no, I think that's that's roughly where I thought we'd land. Well, I'm going to ask the follow-up question I always do when uh, people say, how do I get my uh, survey results, uh, more people filling in the survey? And uh, that is to ask this, ask this question here, uh, which is if a customer uh, leaves negative feedback, particularly in a verbatim box. What do you do with that in your contact center? Do you always contact the customer, go back, see what you can do to improve? Do you usually do that? Do you sometimes do that? Or do you never actually go back and contact the customer? So how frequently uh, do you go back, or does your organization go back to a customer um, uh, if they leave negative feedback on the uh, on the organization and i think this is going to be quite uh, quite fascinating results uh jeanette any ideas where you think the results are likely to come out um i think sometimes contacts the customer might come out top um but i've been in situations where every customer is contacted um, and in the last place that I was uh, head of marketing, uh, if our customers left, left us bad reviews, our CEO would actually ring them personally. So, so, so there's well, one extreme the, to the other. Here's the results. You were indeed right. The, the, the top answer was sometimes contacts the customer, 31%. 17% of people never contact the customer if there's a negative uh, response. 29% always contact the customer and 23% usually. So I think one of the, the things I'm saying, if you haven't got enough customer feedback, are you always contacting the customer if it's negative? Because I, quite often people just want to score and have this nebulous idea that uh, you'd get a bigger statistical survey for collecting, uh, collecting more feedback. I think one of the key uh, takeaways is work on, the, uh, work on the feedback that you already have. Uh, just a reminder, if you're not already uh, logged in, we are carrying on the conversation in the in the chat room. Uh, very straightforward. Just go to your browser. Um, I think we've only got about, uh, we're less than half of the audience logged in. So if you go to a browser or your mobile phone, type in cch.chat, uh, or if you prefer the uh, longer way of doing it, callcenterhelper.com forward slash chat, and then you can go straight in there and uh, you'll be able to take part in the quiz that we have after Jeanette's presentation. So that's probably a good time to move across to uh, Jeanette now. And uh, Jeanette, if you'd like to share with us your strategies for um, customer feedback. Okay, so hopefully, John T, I've pressed the right buttons and everybody can actually see the presentation. We um, can indeed. Unfortunately, I can't, so I'm just going to read my slides. Okay, so um, I think the first few slides of my presentation, everyone, you'll all be very familiar with. Um, if not, then we'll touch on them briefly, but I'll concentrate more towards the latter end of the presentation and give you more information there. So, oh, um, the importance of customer feedback strategies, well, I think hopefully you will all know those. Um, there's lots of statistics out there um, in terms of what impact they could have in your business and your profitability um, and also you know in terms of making it um, a better place for your customer facing staff to be working um, we see you know, that uh, companies with the highest MPS scores grow two times uh, outgrow their competitors two times high engaged customer by more it all makes common sense um, 
I think most of you will have some form of customer feedback strategy. Um, it just depends on the size of your business, how large it is and how many areas you cover. Uh, the basics, I think most of you will know, but if you're not doing this, it's really key. So um, there's a model, the ACFA customer feedback model, which starts off with making sure that you ask your customers for feedback. Um, and one thing added to that is to make sure you're asking for the feedback at different stages of the customer journey. That will give you a, a view over time of how your customers feel about you and your product and services and the services you deliver through the contact centre. Um, categorising the feedback, really important. It, if you want to be able to do something uh, positive with the feedback you're getting and have an impact on areas of the business, categorising it makes it easier to communicate it and distribute it to the right people within the business. Um, so key um, another C although one that I've added in is making sure you communicate that feedback and then following up with customers um, as John T was discussing just before we started um, if you don't follow up uh, with your customers and let them know you're listening to you um, you may not get feedback in the future and clearly acting on your feedback that you receive is really important. That demonstrates to your customers that you're actually listening to what they say um, and actually allows you to improve the customer experience and ultimately hit the bottom line because um, a lot of uh, customer feedback is wrapped up in uh, customer experience um, and you need to be able to demonstrate that you have an impact with what you're doing, especially to uh, the senior management within the business. And I, I think uh, Simon will be talking to you more on that later on. Uh, so asking customers for feedback. There's different ways of asking customer feedback. Um, we've seen that within with the poll uh, that um, or the question that that John T asked earlier on. Um, what we know is that unless you have as a customer an amazing or a horrible experience, um, you're not likely to proactively lead feedback. So asking for it is really important. Uh, there's three main methods to acquire customer feedback. Um, I think most people will use one or at least two of these. Um, that's through customer satisfaction score, the CSAT that you all know, customer effort score, and the net promoter score. Um, marketing tend to use a net promoter score very uh, frequently um, as it gives them a feel of how uh, the product service that you're offering uh, is actually being received and what they can do to improve. And you can use those methods uh, in isolation together. There are limitations as they're far more effective at telling you something's good or bad, but not really why. So just to help you here, if you haven't already got uh, CSAT or customer experience or Net Promoter, in place. There's very simple questions you can ask as part of the customer journey. Um, for example, CSAT at the end calls, you know that, you can do that via SMS, ask um, as somebody else was uh, saying earlier in the chat room, um, <clears throat> or even send out email. Um, customer effort score, again, same sort of thing, um, but much easier to apply uh, in areas where you're dealing maybe with uh, live chats, um, that kind of thing. A net promoter score is more commonly used at the beginning of a customer's journey, but it should be used throughout the customer's life cycle with you um, and tends to be uh, used more in surveys, but you can use it any way you want to. Um, and combine those three will give you a really good feel for how things going with your customers but we need to remember that surveys are king there are rich sources of feedback within the contact center especially if you're dealing with chat email um, and voice communications from the customer but indeed but there are still other methods that can be looked at so we've already talked about surveys you can ask your customers via email you can ask them during the web chat there's community groups um, where you can be the backup from um, using SMS to get feedback and also monitoring social media. There's so much free feedback that you haven't have to elicit within social media channels. It's really worth looking at. So there are other methods, as I said, um, and these probably um, some people will be using and some won't. <coughs> 
particularly I think I see these methods being used in a lot of startups. So creating a custom panel, um, this can be run by any area of the business, but uh, contact centres could do this quite well for the rest of the business. So inviting customers to be on a panel uh, makes them feel special, um, gives you a group of customers who are willing to provide feedback on an ongoing basis. Um, the one thing I do though is to check the profile of panellists against the profile of your whole customer base. Um, because what you don't want to do is to find that you've got a skewed panel and you're not really getting the full spectrum of the feedback that you'd be looking to get. Um, so you might have advocates and it's great to have advocates, but you don't want all your feedback coming from the people who love you. Um, you could also start a community group. Um, I know these are often seen as a little risky and they can be time consuming to manage, but there are uh, companies out there, particularly in fintech, who use these, use these really well. Um, and they actually create customer ambassadors. So they find selected customers who are willing to act as ambassadors and they actually let them run the conversations in the groups for them. Um, be interested to know if any of you out there listening have something similar. Then we've got customer interviews and customer listening sessions. Somebody mentioned that on the chat earlier about uh, ringing customers. That I think these two techniques can be used to complement what else, whatever else you're doing, but you shouldn't use them in isolation. Then you have uh, the ability to use Facebook and social media polls. Uh, they're great for testing the water. Um, just to give you an example, um, as head of marketing for uh, the last company that I worked for, we used a social media poll to choose the names of our products. So we we gave a selection of names to our Facebook uh, community, asked them which ones they liked best, and then we chose the, the name that they liked the best. And then if you've got a uh, high street presence or retail outlets, you can use things like mo mobile beacon surveys, old fashioned, but you could use feedback cards and also insert a survey within your free Wi-Fi. So as people access the Wi-Fi or leave the Wi-Fi, you could put survey, uh, surveys in there as well. So, OK, yes, it's a survey, but it's slightly different. Um, I think it would be diff more difficult to use those in an environment where you don't have a high street presence, but I'm sure somebody will tell me that found a way. And then as I said before, get a lot of feedback from customers that isn't necessarily asked for or proactively given. So uh, monitoring, monitoring your media channels uh, is a good idea. You can use uh, applications that alert you if your brand name is mentioned or um, one of the services or products that you're offering is mentioned and those can come to you so you don't have to troll the social media channels to look. You can review uh, live on, on web chat transcripts. There'll be lots of customer feedback within those, for example, valuable to the contact centre looking at what are the uh, theme in the questions that are being asked. Are they the same questions? Is there something that you can do to change your FAQs online, for example, reduce your call volumes? Um, you can analyse your recorded sales and service calls. I know that speech analytics software can help you mine this data really easily. Um, it tends to be used much more, or in the environments I worked in, we tended to use it much more to look for where, the, where our calls compliant. But um, from, a, from a marketing perspective or an insight perspective, actually looking for, again, things within uh, those calls which you can get a great uh, speech analytics programmer to help pull that information out for you. And then if you've got an online business or an online presence and your customers are coming to your website online, recording the website visitor session replays is really great. Uh, you get click, move, scroll, heat maps showing how your customers are using the website, what they're looking at and that can really help you improve the service and the information. Uh, that's on your website. And as I said before, they, these methods can help you um, avoid survey fatigue, especially if you've got a small customer base. Um, the, the last company I worked for, we had 660 customers when I started, 4,000 when I left. Um, 
and that's a small number to keep surveying. So we had to use all of those different methods that I've talked about. Uh, I did briefly mention about the timing um, of uh, when we ask customers for feedback. It's really, I think, key to making sure um, that you're doing everything to ignore customers and drive loyalty. Um, and you can only do that if you're measuring how they feel about your service and product um, at different points within the customer life cycle. And you can create maps of CSAT scores or customer effort scores, NPS scores, um, and other feedback that you get. And it just helps you drive more powerful strategies, whether they're acquisition, customer value growth, loyalty, or retention. Um, and customer value growth, just in case anyone's not sure, what I mean by that is the actual value to the company of that customer um, and the profitability of that customer to your company. So the first step in having a system in place um, for categorising customer feedback, which I mentioned earlier on, is to make sure that you do have something there. Um, it's great if you've got some kind of system that can log everything for you. If you're not at that size, you can do it on spreadsheets, um, but it's going to be more difficult um, as you grow. So it's wise to have a scalable system uh, that can cope with growth and particularly adding categories. There's nothing worse than getting further down the line and finding that you don't have enough subcategories and then try and add them and finding your system doesn't allow you to do that. Um, as I said before, categorising enables you to get the data to the right person um, who can actually make sure that action is taken on it. Typically, there are three main categories, uh, product, customer service, marketing and sales. They'll be the main categories and then you can break those down into subcategories. Um, so let's whiz through product feedback. So I think that's more related to people who work in marketing, but you want to know if there's any major product flaws or bugs. Um, typically, if you're, if a core feature of your product is accessed online, customers can't access it, you want to get that fixed as soon as you can. Um, for minor product flaws, you may not need to fix that quickly, but you need to do something that can be prioritised. So that could be customers receiving two copies of the same email, or even if there's a typo in an email that you're sending out. And then feature requests, really important, especially for your product development team. Um, making sure that if customers are mentioning that something isn't available that they'd like to have, or um, there's feedback that's suggesting something might be missing um, from your portal service, get that to the right person, they can build that into the product road. For customer feedback, I'm sure all of you who work in the content centre will um, be aware of the different categories that you work with now. Um, for me, I would say it's probably more difficult to categorise customer service related feedback, and it depends on what your organisation is based on. Um, if it's looking at minimising complaints about your products or services, whether you look at reducing call volumes or reducing ADHT, or just improving the customer experience, the questions that you're going to be asking are different, the categories that you have in place will be different. Um, and just remember, in some cases, you don't need to ask customers for feedback. It's there and you can just pick it up and make sure that um, it's categorised and sent off to the right areas for action. Um, and also, whatever you do, um, it's likely to be able to help you drive down call or check volumes and reduce your operational costs. So there's benefit there as well. Sales and marketing need feedback subcategories. Well, uh, again, it needs careful thought. We want to involve the people in sales and marketing in, in deciding what categories there are. But just an example, they'll probably want to know, are there any areas in the marketing material or are people making unrealistic promises? You don't want a salesperson saying that a feature is available when it's not. Um, and you need to get that information back to the right area as soon as possible and even perhaps to training. Um, and if you want to make sure your customers are understanding what you're buying and that your product delivers value to them, that, then you need a category for that. Um, and I think probably you can work out some of your own working with your own colleagues. The one thing I would caution, though, is don't go overboard on the number of subcategories. Too much granularity can make it difficult uh, to identify themes that you need to act on quickly. Um, 
I put granularity in, but just too much information, really. Um, you get information overload, especially with the amount of feedback that you probably aren't aware that you've got. And then you've got a really key thing, which is to flow up um, with your customers. Customers want to know that you're listening um, to them, that you're um, going to do something with their feedback. Um, and critically, when you do that, it helps to generate ongoing feedback. You, I, you heard me, so I'll continue giving that feedback. And you can give the feedback um, to the customers in terms of the fact that you've you're acknowledged them is by thank you emails. Better to be personalised if possible. You could do a standard email that has a personalised top and tail, which is nice. Um, a thank you gift. Some places. Um, Companies will give fair gifts in the form of vouchers, corporate branded items like, you know, I know there's always a joke about a pen, but actually if you get a free pen, most people would be happy with that. Um, some companies, especially ones that are focused online, will use uh, badges of honour um, and actually allow, they'll have a way that that displays in the customer's account. Or they'll even invite customers to be an ambassador for them. Um, I mentioned that earlier, there's a company, somebody will have heard called Revolut, um, and they have a customer ambassador. I think Monzo also does the same thing. Um, then you could also have a display board on your website, which, which shows, um, for example, the new product features that you're developing or the status of those, especially if they come feedback from the customer. Um, and it just gives them something to look at, feeling like they're part of your journey. Um, and then you could do shout out in letters or blogs um, or display uh, customer re reviews and recommendations on your website. Um, don't forget, you know, if the customer is giving you a great review, you should be proud of that and play it. Um, and that all helps um, continue a continuous feedback loop with your customers. So acting on feedback is essential. There's no point in gathering the feedback, looking at it, and doing things with it, um, and not doing anything with it, sorry. So acting on it's great, but there may be some feedback that you can't act on. For example, I uh, developed a product which is an identity theft protection product. Um, it was designed to protect people from having their ID stolen and people committing financial fraud. We held a customer focus group and the customers there loved the concept of the product, um, loved all the features and benefits. He said, I'd love it to do one more thing for me. And uh, he said, I see this as uh, protecting me and my identity. What I'd like, if I was in the middle of a war zone, I'd like you to be able to send in a helicopter and pull me out and take me to safety. Hmm. Well, clearly our product wasn't designed to do that at all. There was no way we were going to add that feature. Um, luckily, we were in a face-to-face -face situation and we could talk to him about it, which we did. Um, and he was quite happy understanding that. Um, moving on now, we have, um, you know, make sure you identify preferred formats and frequency for receiving uh, the data um, from uh, the contact centre. So it, it may be different for each department. Uh, make sure you know who should receive the feedback um, and then you can drive uh, the right action. It would be great to have somebody who was responsible for overseeing this process. Um, so somebody who can agree actions to be taken with the relevant people, who's tracking the progress and completion of action, and then monitoring the impact. Um, I was reading uh, an article today talking about customer experience uh, as a profession and saying that it's becoming coming into difficult because it's hard to demonstrate the impact of the work that customer experience people do. Um, monitoring the impact in this way will allow that demonstration to happen. Um, so you can actually see um, in a lot of cases, each action having an impact, whether that's increasing engagement, which will eventually increase profitability of the customer, um, or actually reducing costs in some areas. And it's really important to demonstrate that to senior management. And finally, 
what should you do then if you already have a, a feedback strategy in place then um kick the tires on it have a look at it does it cover um all of the areas you know if you have five different channels where customers can be providing feedback through voice web chat email social media groups whatever make sure you're capturing all of the information that you, is kind of important to you and important in driving that customer centric focus and look at how you can enhance what you've got there already and then of course then any coach will say you've got to act on that as well so i'm going to hand you back uh to Dante now i think indeed well thank you very much indeed for that uh, some uh, great insight we're going to be jumping across in a short while to do a quiz uh, so if you're not logged into the chat room, now is the uh, time to do it. Very simple, just on your, uh, uh, you can either type in callcenthelper.com forward slash chat, or actually we've got this little speed dial, you can just put that straight into the uh, ad uh, address bar of your uh, browser, and you can go to cch.chat. Uh, just a couple of points from Jeanette's presentation I thought were, were really good. I love the idea of a, a customer panel, uh, it's rather nice to call them on uh, focus groups because I found that focus groups do anything other than anything other than focus. Uh, reviewing live uh, uh, live chat transcripts and it is a wealth of information in the uh, in the live uh, live uh, chat transcripts. So it was very fascinating the the timing that if you you know the, the danger is if you're surveying people too early in their lifestyle with the company, uh, you may not be getting to optimum satisfaction levels. So for instance, if you do it after they've just signed up uh, they probably haven't got a lot of experience there uh, the onboarding process can sometimes be a bit uh, problematic but immediately after that could be the, a very good time to uh, to get uh, peak feedback and i think Jeanette, you made a very um very relevant point there um customers want to know that you are listening so it's very yes. important you uh, you go back to people so i think that's a that's a great uh, feedback great point there great tip Customers want to know you are uh, you are listening, so uh, that's very good. Right, we're going to go across now, and we're going to do a quiz. I think most people are logged into the chat room. Callcenthelper.com forward slash chat. Uh, get ready to vote using these buttons A, B, C, D uh, in the chat room. So uh, the first question in Jeanette's presentation: A C F A in the customer feedback loop. What does the C stand for in the customer feedback loop? Is it capture? Uh, a is it B categorize is it C classify or is it D communicate so just like to vote on there does what does the C stand for in A C F A is it A capture B categorize uh, C classify or D communicate but 26 votes in so far I think there's a few more um, coming in so we're up to 30 there I'll just give you two seconds more to uh, vote on the first question what does the a, uh, what does the C stand for in AFCA? Well, the answer, 21 of you have got the uh, right answer, which was categorize. Uh, according to Jeanette, ACFA stands for ask, categorize, follow up, and act. I think it's a very good uh, uh, an acronym there. Which entrepreneur once said, your most unhappy customers are your greatest source of learning? Was it A, Bill Gates? Was it B, Jeff Bezos? Was it C, Elon Musk? Was it D, Richard Branson? So which entrepreneur once said your most unhappy customers are your greatest source of learning? So uh, let's have a look at the, uh, have a look at the answers now. And um, uh, actually, most of you didn't get the right answer there. The right answer was uh, Bill Gates. Ten of you got that uh, right. Um, so uh, uh, Bill Gates also once said, uh, we all need people who give us feedback. That's how we improve. I think some very uh, sage advice uh, there. So Sarah, Sarah's top of the uh, leaderboard so far. Which of the following methods for gathering customer feedback did Jeanette not recommend? Was it A, automated phone calls, B, customer panels, C, monitoring social media, or D, renew, reviewing chat? Uh, transcripts. Which one did Jeanette not recommend on that list? 
A, automated phone calls, B, customer files, C, so man monitoring social media or reviewing chat transcripts. Well, the answer I think most of you got there was uh, automated phone calls was not one of the methods recommended. Uh, automated phone calls and to an extent automated emails can be in, in invasive. Does anyone like it to pick up the phone to a robotic voice? Um, so uh, let's have a look. According to TripAdvisor, which of the following companies has the lowest travel rating based on customer reviews? Customer reviews are a great form of uh, customer feedback. Is it A, British Airways, B, EasyJet, C, JetBlue, or is it D, Ryanair? Which of those four had the uh, uh, lowest rating, traveler rating based on uh, uh, customer reviews on TripAdvisor. So the uh, answer, 18 of you got the correct answer, which is Ryanair. Uh, Ryanair uh, travelers gave uh, Ryanair just three out of five points, uh, while JetBlue scored the best out of all the uh, options that we gave, uh, gave there. And the final question, which Hollywood actor once tipped a waiter $4,000 for a bottle of wine thanking them for great customer service. Was it A, Brad Pitt, B, Leonardo DiCaprio, C, Johnny Depp, or D, Tom Cruise? I think this is uh, customer feedback at uh, an extreme. Let's have a look at which of these uh, uh, stars gave the, uh, uh, the tip, and uh, most of you got that right. Uh, it was all the, 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 the highest answer on there, Johnny Depp. Uh, Johnny Depp uh, was filming the movie Public Enemies, and spent many an evening in the Chicago Steakhouse called Gibson's. On one of his last nights there, he tipped away to $4,000 for their excellent service. So uh, it would be rather nice if people did that in, uh, in contact centers. Um, so let's have a look. And it is Abdul there has uh, uh, actually uh, tipped uh, Sarah to the winner uh, and uh, we'll be getting uh, a prize from us. We'll be uh, getting in touch with you, with you shortly. So let's just go and have a look at what's uh, been going on in the uh, uh, what's been going on in the chat room. Lots of stuff going through there. Johnny said we listen to uh, uh, and contact anyone from the IVR survey who scores only one or two out of a maximum of five. We have a quality coach uh, in our, our customer service centre, about 25 FTVs there and they contact all the dis, uh, dissatisfied customers as part of their, of their tasks. We've had a question in from uh, Sarah, saying follow up with every instance of feedback is a great idea, but how would a small contact center, for instance, less than 20 agents over all of the platforms, do this efficiently if, uh, if manpower or, or person power is limited? Have you got a, a, a thought on that, uh, Jeanette? Uh, yes, I mean, um, you don't have to have somebody physically um, do that. So if you're following up, um, you could have something that's automated as some kind of way of um, inserting some personalization in it. So, you know, like almost like a mail merge example of a, a standard document. So you can follow up in that way. Um, you can do the follow up um, in a general newsletter. So if you can't send uh, or, or contact every customer uh, that gives feedback immediately, you could do a shout out in newsletters um, and even, you know, name some of those customers like Wendy from Conway or Wendy from Monmouth gave us this feedback. So you can still engage and follow up with those customers um, and if you don't have the manpower to do it with every individual one and do it in a newsletter or um, a broadcast email. Indeed, well, I think Jade's uh, answered uh, that one by saying automate where you where you can. I've got a question well for, for Simon. What about evaluating emotion, uh, looking at how the how the, the customer feels? Uh, have you got any suggestions on that one, Simon? I think we might have lost uh, Simon's uh, Simon's audio there. So. Uh, Thank you. I was muted. Ah. There we go. Um, yeah, it's a really good point. I mean, to really capture emotion, you have to be using lots of different techniques. Um, you know, you're only going to get so much from your surveys. Um, so, you know, listening to calls, um, speaking directly to customers is a good way of doing it. Uh, you know, 
there is one benefit actually of the IVR um, post-contact survey. You know, I appreciate some people don't necessarily like that automated route, but it does give you the opportunity to capture um, feedback from a customer in their own words. And that sound file that you typically collect can have a huge benefit to be able to hear the emotion in the customer's voice, which is a brilliant thing to have when you're playing to team members to kind of illustrate a point of change. And even more powerful, if you need to play out you know, how disgruntled a customer is to hammer home a point in a board meeting. Um, a sound file can be worth its weight in gold. Mm. I think that's uh, some very, uh, very sage uh, feedback there. Well, probably a good time now to uh, jump across to Simon. And uh, Simon, if you'd like to uh, share with us uh, your thoughts on uh, on customer feedback strategies. So I'll just pass the uh, control across to you, uh, to you there. You can Thank you, John the... T. Well, thank you very much and um, good afternoon, everyone, again. Um, uh, what I wanted to do was was share some thoughts to complement um, Jeanette's fantastic presentation um, and really draw out some of my experiences of how companies can use different approaches to make their customer feedback programs more effective. Um, and, uh, you know, we've talked about lots of different uh, methodologies and ways of, uh, of going about um, utilizing customer feedback programs. But what I wanted to share, um, first of all, just to set the scene was, you know, th there's no doubt at all that the world of customer feedback and the industry as a whole um, is, is growing at a rapid pace. There is an awful lot of money being spent on um, the collection of customer feedback. But what is really interesting to to me is that there is very little evidence or only a, a small amount of evidence um, that is out of proportion that that really suggests that companies are really you know being able to transform take real value from their customer feedback programs quantify it and so on and so on and for me i think there's a number of reasons behind that um you know i think silos remains an issue data challenges you know i still think leadership is is a big problem i think lots of leaders um still say they want customer feedback but it's very much a tick box exercise rather than being um you know truly something that's embedded in their culture and i also think there's there's still quite a considerable lack of investment um particularly when we talk about you know the follow up action and the taking um you know the taking you know contact with customers to say thank you all of that sort of thing companies do struggle with from a resource perspective but i don't want to focus on those too much today what i wanted to talk about was something that i think is is still a significant problem um and something that I think remains a challenge, certainly in my experience, for most organisations, and that is um, how do um, businesses and CX professionals really actively engage with key stakeholders around their business to take that insight and that feedback they've collected and use that to improve? And it's that engagement um, and you know ability to influence others that I think a lot of CX professionals, particularly those that are responsible for feedback and insight, really struggle with. Um, and what I've shown on screen, on screen here is, um, is something that's been coined by a colleague of mine, Alex Barker, um, called the fragility of enthusiasm. Um, it, it might sound like a bit of a tongue-in-cheek um, term, but I think this is very, very common uh, in a lot of organizations that are going about trying to um, use customer feedback is that, you know, they start a program and it's all very exciting at first and, um, you know, there's lots of attention and people are, you know, really enthusiastic about the whole thing. But then you, you kind of reach this kind of peak level and then very quickly, a lot of organizations suddenly realize, oh, hold on a minute, actually changing and using this insight to drive action and, and drive improvements is going to be really hard. You know, it's going to take a lot of money. It's going to take a lot of time. And people quickly start losing that enthusiasm. Um, and, you know, projects start to wane. You start to hit, you know, roadblocks, people challenging data and so on and so on. So the influencing aspect for me is absolutely crucial um, and in some ways more important than the actual collection me mechanism itself. And in some instances, you know, programs fail because of that, that very element. So I think what's more frequently happening, particularly in the UK at the moment, is, is what I've shown on screen now, um, this, this kind of spreadsheet fatigue. Um, and what I mean by that is too often I see customer feedback people, you know, spending, you know, days on end 
pulling together feedback insights into pretty pictures and graphs and tabular formats and it gets emailed out to a stakeholder group and over time that you know slowly drifts down the pile of unopened unglanced at emails you know the engagement's lost and and fundamentally feedback you know an insight teams just are left banging the head against a brick wall so so you know how do we try and tackle that? Well, the first thing I wanted to cover was was tactics for influencing key business stakeholders, because I think this is really, really important. Um, I think the first thing um, that we've all got to be thinking about is storytelling. You know, the art of good storytelling and the ability to relate to others is absolutely crucial. Um, and if I think of, I, I always think of someone like a Stephen Fry as a brilliant storyteller. You know, someone that can relate to the audience, they can bring things to life, they can, you know, build a sense of anticipation, all those sorts of things. I think that uh, crucially is what um, sit back in the insight story they're trying to collect. But just to give some kind of practical tips, um, the first thing that I think people need to think about, and I'd urge everyone to do this as well, is to think about, first of all, who are the key decision makers, people I need to influence, you know, the stakeholders around the business that I need to um, uh, really rub shoulders with to try and elicit some kind of change or improvement in the business. So map this out, first of all. You know, and it's pretty obvious, you know, if we're looking at the leadership level, you know, we've got to be talking through a financial lens. We've got to be thinking more strategically rather than tactically. You know, our projects need to be aligned to things like corporate objectives and values. You know, without that leadership sponsorship, um, you, you know, projects will fundamentally fail. Another thing that people have got to be looking at is, is stakeholders that we need to influence around the business that may not um, think about customer experience like we may do. You know, people in, I don't know, billing or repairs or logistics, they may not um, consider their actions and their team's performance that has an impact on the overall customer journey. So we have to show them what impact that might look like and speak their language so they can understand. I absolutely believe customer feedback and insight, however we've collected that, should form a significant part in our coaching and management structures. And Frontline access, which is something I'm going to talk about shortly, I think is an absolutely crucial piece to this puzzle. So once you've laid out who you're going to um, focus on, I think the next thing you've got to try and do um, is just do a bit of sanity checking. Um, so think about a four step process. And, and when I used to manage a customer insight program, these were the sorts of things that I'd sit myself into a darkened corner and say, have I ticked the box against these four areas? First of which is timely. Um, which I think is still a problem for lots. You know, it's taken you lots of time to come up with the answer, the you know, the insight, because you know, surveys are coming out too late, or it's taken you days to pour over your transcripts, whatever that might be. If it's not in the here and now, people will question the validity because fundamentally contact centers change so quickly. It's got to be reliable. So coming back to this statistically robust um, number, is it statistically confident? Can we can we guarantee that this this problem or this area that we need to solve actually exists. The last thing anyone wants to be is a, you know, a boy that cried wolf and has shouted about some problem that doesn't really exist. It's got to be compelling. You know, I've seen far too many people chase their tails and looking for feedback that fundamentally doesn't excite anyone in the business. You know, just because you found out two or three percent of your callers like green sleeves as they hold music doesn't mean to say that is a wow piece of insight that anyone's going to do anything with um, and it's got to be digestible as well and this is a key when you're talking about the different stakeholders you want to influence um, you know we need to drop the cx acronyms we need to stop talking about you know flashy research type words like correlation analysis regression analysis and and be real you know we need to give it give this information to our, our colleagues and our, our, our stakeholders so that they can take immediate action. They get how it impacts them. But fundamentally, for me to get some, some kind of uh, common ground and start building some, um, some, uh, some success, you've got to look for some small quick wins. You know, start small. Don't think your feedback program is going to change the entire direction of the company straight away. Um, think about small areas that you can make improvements on and link everything back to the financials. That's what will get everyone standing up and paying attention. And just the final thing on this topic, um, the other thing that I think people forget is 
personal drivers of those that are trying to be influenced. So people might understand what is driving people in terms of what their business drivers are, what their targets are um, as, a, as a department. But we've also got to think about these people we're trying to influence, these people we're trying to get them to do something or change something. What is their own personal motivations? What means that they'll get their next pay rise or their next bonus? We've got to be thinking through those sorts of lenses. So this is just a quick, um, uh, you know, crude mock-up of maybe some of the things that might, um, you know, turn people's lights on or keep people up at night. I'd urge everyone to think about a similar sort of, um, of process before they start sharing the insight and uh, tackling people. But fundamentally, it's not a one size fits all. So these kind of generic spreadsheets that go out really, for me, need to change. We've got to be tailoring this insight to the different groups. The next thing I, I wanted to cover off was um, the importance of the front line, because for me, this is a, this is a worrying trend, actually. I think that more and more marketing teams um, are controlling feedback programs using all of the different mechanisms that Jeanette talked about. Um, but unfortunately, insight isn't shared as readily these days um, at the front line. And that to me is a big missed opportunity. One, because that, you know, the improvement and, um, you know, operational performance aspect um, is lost there. But there is also, I believe a huge motivational factor of sharing that customer insight directly to your front line. Um, and if I explain that, I'm, I'm going to use um, a, a methodology that um, that was from a chap called Dan Pink, who um, talks about intrinsic motivators. Um, and in essence, what he's talking about is, you know, forget things like bonuses and pay and you know team nights out. The things that really get frontline staff excited and and you know committing to the cause and getting on the bus whatever you want to term that they have to have things like autonomy mastery and purpose those are the things that really motivate people so if we break these down um to me i think this plays perfectly into customer feedback so if you're talking about mastery that's all about the desire to improve and I think fundamentally frontline call center agents do want to improve, but they don't necessarily always have the culture or the ability to, you know, or the information available to do that. So if you can give customer feedback, real time customer feedback to them, they can use that to start self correcting and developing. And I usually see a 10% swing by, you know, giving them a dashboard or something like that to, um, to be able to see what's happening. Big impact in terms of removing any kind of subjectivity from your QA process. Um, you know, lots of advantages to be able to link into scorecards. You know, there's still lots of scorecards I see that are purely born out of internal operational KPIs, but surely, you know, what our customers are saying at a CX level, that should be something that we're measuring and sharing as part of a scorecard. And, and also and coming back to this 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 kind of voice um, and sound file, you know, for an agent to hear the emotion in a customer's voice, particularly if it's good and it's positive, it can be hugely hugely motivational. Particularly if, if you've had 40 calls that day that haven't been particularly happy, and someone takes the time to say, "Look, you did a really w job well done." That has a that has a big impact. From a purpose perspective, you know, I think this is all about you know, giving frontline people the ability to see their own contribution to the wider good, the wider business success. So again, feedback can be used to link to company performance scores, you know, voice of the employee um, uh, type surveys, I don't think we've talked about yet, but a hugely powerful way of understanding, um, uh, you know, what goes on, what is driving dissatisfaction with your customers, you know, more companies should be tapping into that. And also to identify you know, who are your top performers? Who are consist consistently delivering great service? And how can we kind of emulate that? Take that DNA and build it back into our training and coaching. The, the autonomy piece is all about giving people um, the opportunity to take some control of what they're doing, which is not easy in a contact center environment. But encouraging a culture of Look, my feedback um, and you know my scores, whatever that might be, are starting to drop. I want some help. Could you you know put me through some coaching? Could you give me some guidance? That's powerful. 
And I'm also seeing um, a move towards this kind of model office type approach where small pockets of agency use half the time on the phones, half the time to solve problems. And I think that's a really powerful technique to build culture, to build engagement, and also fundamentally to, you know, to iron out problems that, you know, your advisor community will see all the time. But if you remove from it, you may not have experienced. So lots of performance improvement opportunities and lots of motivational um, aspects as well. And this is just a you know example of of vid in action. I mean you know culturally people have to embrace customer feedback. If your frontline staff think it's just another stick to beat them up with, if you don't land this in a way that they think it's Big Brother watching them, fundamentally again your program will fail. So mm -hmm. landing this from a, a positive cultural perspective is really important. And just finally, and this is really just to reiterate um, uh, Jeanette's excellent point. This closing the loop piece is so important. Um, I, it's funny, actually, given the poll that we ran earlier on, I, I ran a little experiment with my family um, last year, and I asked, I asked them to fill out as many surveys as they could, um, phone, email, whatever that might be, with one purpose of putting in there, I'm unhappy, I'd like a call, or I'd like someone to contact me. And the results were staggeringly poor, if I'm honest. So 32 surveys completed. 25 generic thank you for your feedback straight automatic pop-ups five generic we shall investigate and we promise to do some training even though we haven't told them what was wrong and only two genuine desires to close the loop now that is just a staggering waste of effort and opportunity um and i think you know i don't want to paint a, a negative picture but i think a lot of the bigger organizations fall into this bracket um i think some of the the, the kind of more sme businesses do understand and 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 are being more proactive in closing the loop but i think you know everyone really needs to be thinking how they can do this because fundamentally you know the experts are saying 11 percent of churn could be avoided um by simple outreach and just Take it from me because I've lived and breathed this for many years. If you take the time to ring a customer back when they've left you negative feedback um, and you say, look, we're really sorry. We got it wrong on this occasion. We'd really like to put it right. They will be floored. They will be absolutely dumbstruck. And it's one of the quickest ways of turning a detractor into a promoter. Um, it's uh, it's well worth having a go and just seeing the the actual sheer surprise and joy in your customer's eyes when you give it a go. So um, that is just a few points I wanted to share with you. Um, again, just to reiterate, I'll be, speak, I'll be sharing some more thoughts at our um, event on the 17th of March and Disrupt. Um, everyone is welcome. Um, we'd love you to register. We've got some fantastic speakers. And if you, uh, if you want to hear more, please feel free to, uh, to get in touch with me uh, directly there. Um, my email address is on the bottom of the screen, my phone number there as well. So thank you very much. And I'll hand back to, uh, to John T. John T, you're still on mute. Uh, hopefully, I'm back there now. So, thank you very much for that, indeed, uh, Simon. Some uh, great, uh, great feedback there. Um, Simon has said that uh, if anyone would like to have a audit, a savvy audit is a free of charge service. If you're based in the UK, uh, one of the um, Savio team could uh, give you a run through of your feedback strategies and give you some pointers for how that can be. Approved. If just like to vote on that in the uh, in the poll now would be uh, good. And um, some of the the uh, comments from Simon thought were very uh, valid. There, the um, fragility of enthusiasm. How a management team often realizes how hard it becomes uh, and starts to challenge the data. I think that's a, a very important thing. Um, I love your section there, Simon. When you said hearing the feedback from a customer saying job well done. Is a powerful motivator. I think that's a, uh, a great takeaway. Another takeaway: 11% of customer churn could be prevent could be uh, prevented by a simple company outreach. I think some uh, great feedback there. We've got just a, a couple of um, things in the chat room. We've got time for. Um, Johnny said our coaching team also leads on training. Uh, does quality monitoring on all channels and supports the two team leaders in terms of quality and satisfaction. Since we've implemented that, the role uh, 18 months ago, our, our customer satisfaction has gone up from 83 to 94%. But we're profit for purpose and satisfaction is the heart of, uh, uh, of what we do. Uh, Mohammed said, uh, one of your uh, CSAT questions should measure emotion 
Uh, customers will forget what, forget what you did, but will never forget what, how they made them feel. And um, a couple of interesting bits came through. Bella said, we had a quality coaching team, but has since uh, been given back to team leaders of specific teams and has slightly dropped. I think uh, shared uh, there with by Monique, who said team leaders often don't have time for sufficient uh, QM review unless it's part of your KPIs. But unfortunately, we've uh, run out of uh, time for the uh, minute. Um, uh, we've got our own uh, feedback uh, mechanism. I'd just like to say in the chat room, in one or two words, what did you like best about the uh, webinar? While you're doing that, I'll announce today's uh, winning tip. And that comes from Harry, who says, changing your scoring system to set something like 1, 1 to 9 to ensure accuracy. Some customers tend to score 1 instead of 10 by mistake. <laughs> any, uh, any numbering system uh, is often very difficult because it one is could be bottom of the scale, one could also be top of the scale, depending on uh, how your view is it. Uh, we've also got a little uh, post-course survey that's uh, four questions long. And uh, just like to say thank you very much to our two speakers for joining us today. Thank you very much, uh, Jeanette, for joining us. Very welcome. Um, very enjoyable and exciting for me for my very first webinar. So thank you. Wonderful. And thank you, Simon, for joining us as well. Thanks, John. Too. Thank you for having me. Okay, thanks very much. And we'll be back same time next week. Thank you then. Bye-bye.